Um, so I'll get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Jessica Duez. I am the Visitor Services Intern at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, sponsored by the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. We are a 501c3 nonprofit established in 1997 to support Ohio's only National Wildlife Refuge complex with youth development, public use projects, and most recently land acquisition and restoration. We are located along the southern shore of Lake Erie near Oak Harbor in some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. If you are interested in learning more about us and what we do, I will leave a link in the chat right now. This link will point you in the right direction to become a member, make a tax deductible donation to support our work, or even to shop our online nature store. Today, I am joined by Amy Stone and Marnie Tichnell. Amy Stone is an extension educator with Ohio State University in Lucas County. Amy has earned degrees in landscape and turf management and vocational education. While she loves the beautiful side of horticulture, she has been drawn in to work on invasive species and outreach and educational efforts on these unwanted pests. Marnie received her Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Management and Forestry from The Ohio State University in 2004. She continued her study of forest wildlife at OSU School of Environment and Natural Resources, where she has obtained her Master of Science in 2007. In late 2007, she became a Wildlife Extension Program Specialist for OSU Extension. They both have so graciously joined us today to share their program, Landscaping for Birds, with us. Before we begin, I will ask that you stay muted to minimize background noise for our presenters. If you have any questions, please ask them by putting them in the chat box as we go, and we have time for a Q&A at the end of the program. So now I will turn it over to Amy and Marnie to get started. Thanks, Jessica, and uh, hello, everybody. Amy and I are very happy to be here. I think this is a topic we're both passionate about, and uh, so yeah, thanks for, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so today we're going to be focusing on plants, specifically native trees and shrubs, to incorporate into your landscape, um, and specifically those that provide habitat resources to birds, but we're going to mention some other wildlife as well. So we're going to tag team this presentation today. You're going to be hearing from both of us, uh, but I'm going to get us started. And I'm going to start with a brief explanation as to why Amy and I feel it's important to provide habitat to wildlife in our backyards, landscapes, and other green spaces within our community, um, especially as we continue to develop new areas. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about here. So as you can see from this graphic, this is from Bloomberg, you can see the different land use categories in the U.S. and the amount of land dedicated to each category. So the bigger the block, the, um, the more land that is dedicated to that use. So um, I wanna draw your attention to the pink areas and those represent urban and rural housing. Now, despite its comparatively smaller size with some of those other blocks, urban growth is outpacing growth in all other land use categories. Uh, in fact, it's growing 1 million acres every year and just to give you some perspective, that's about the size of LA, Houston, and Phoenix combined. So that amount of land every year. And um, if we look to Ohio, we see that uh, we've had a 90% increase in development in the past 30 years. I live north of Columbus, and um, I can tell you I'm definitely seeing that growth here. Uh, where I live, most of our, our farm fields have now been converted into housing developments or other commercial properties. And this urban and rural growth is not expected to stop anytime soon. So we really need to start looking to these rapidly growing areas, our own habitats, and ask how we can provide habitat for wildlife. Because they need our help. So perhaps um, those, perhaps a lot of you have seen this graphic before, especially if you're a, a birder or a nature enthusiast. Um, this is research that came out in, in the past few years, and it's based on a very long-term uh, set of data. And they found that we have lost nearly 3 billion birds since 1970, which is estimated to be about one in every four birds. And this is due to several different reasons, but largely lack of or degradation of habitat. 
And as you'll note on this slide, we're seeing declines across many guilds of songbirds. So we're seeing declines within our grassland birds, our migratory species, and our inser uh, aerial insectivores like um, barn swallows and, and, and tree swallows, flycatchers, okay? <clears throat> And I'm sure that many of you are also aware of the declines in our insect pollinator populations. Monarch butterflies were recently listed as a candidate under the Endangered Species Act. What does that mean? Okay, I had to read up on it when I heard that, re that uh, result as well. So essentially what it means is they're on a watch list. It means their populations are, are very vulner vulnerable right now, but there are other species that are more at risk and take higher priority. That said, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will assess their population every year until stability is achieved. And if, if things get worse, it may bump them up higher on that priority list. But this gives us time, right? It gives us time to kind of turn things around, provide and restore habitat for monarchs. And, you know, realizing that monarchs are really kind of that flagship species for pollinator conservation. And many of the things that we do for them are going to benefit other pollinators as well. So maybe you're wondering at this point why I'm talking about pollinators when this is a bird talk. Well, it's because many bird food webs include pollinators, whether, um, you know, the pollinators end up being a food source themselves. We're going to talk about that a lot when we talk about caterpillars. Um, or maybe those pollinators are providing food sources that birds need, like nectar um, or helping to provide food sources, berries, seeds, and nuts, you know, which we get from our plants once they're pollinated. I also find that many folks who are um, sensitive to providing or working to provide habitat for birds in their backyards are also providing habitat for pollinators. And, and so the really great news is that those two objectives go hand in hand. So as Amy and I go through our talk today and when we start focusing on different plants, we're going to be including information on both birds and, and pollinators. So hopefully you all don't mind that. So now let's move into some good news. Um, if we, you know, let's ask the question, if we work to provide habitat in our rural and urban areas and our habitats, will it actually make a difference? And based on some research, the answer is yes. Okay, so green spaces within our communities can be hotspots for biodiversity in, in, in some cases, and they can provide really important habitat to wildlife. So here's just one example. Uh, this research took place in uh, Columbus, Ohio, on the OSU Mansfield campus. So if you're all familiar with that, if you're at all familiar with that area, you know it's very urban, it's very populated, um, lots of residential space, of course, you know, college kids abound. Um, but that little woodland patch that you're looking at in the middle of the screen right here, this is being used as a stopover habitat for migratory birds. So birds that are um, traveling north, heading to their breeding lands, they're going to stop, rest, and refuel in that forest patch um, and, and get a much need, needed break. So for those of you that are, are land managers uh, on the call or, or even just landowners, the, there is really big potential to manage these small forest patch um, for stopover habitat for these songbirds. Or, you know, not, you know, not to mention all of the other birds that will regularly use these small forest patches, you know, our robins and cardinals and chickadees and, and titmice. So on that note, I did want to share a publication. It's relatively new. It's only a little over a year old. And uh, it's a really great guide for land managers or landowners interested in managing their smaller forest patches for birds. And you can access that uh, on that, that site right there. And I think Amy's going to work to to pop in the, um, that website into the chat box. Oh, she's already got it. She's on it. So now for those of you that are homeowners and the land is your own backyard, I feel you. I'm in that same uh, position. I don't own more than a quarter of an acre <laughs> that surrounds my house. Um, so what also draws, draws my eye in this picture are, you know, all of the, the neighborhood and you can see the green in that neighborhood. And so there's a lot of potential for backyard habitats, especially if they're in close proximity to small forest patches. Um, you know, the, if you're near a forest patch like this, um, 
there's a lot that you can do to, you know, draw birds away from there and, and visit your backyards to kind of to um, take advantage of any resources that you're putting there. And the more we can do in our own backyards, the more we're going to be creating connectivity in the landscape, you know, remembering our wildlife have this pun intended bird's eye view. And so if they see that connectivity, um, you know, that's helpful to them in nav navigating the resource. And it's also uh, makes it easier for them to find um, find resources. So I, I really feel that this, this is the kind of thinking and the, the things that we need to do uh, as part of our plan and strategy to conserve our wildlife populations, you know, in light of all that development going on. So where do we start? Okay, when, when we talk about managing for any wildlife species, um, we have to remember to provide habitat throughout the year and account for changing needs. So we're gonna look at this little songbird uh, as an example, and I'm sure many of you know what this is, but if you do, pop it in the chat. So this bird feeds primarily uh, well, it feeds itself and it's young on insect during the summer, but as we progress into the fall, insects aren't the only needed food source. Um, and a couple of you are right, Omar and Deb Johnson, yes, um, Eastern blue uh, bluebird, good job. So bluebirds, as do many other birds, they expand their diets to include more berries that are rich in lipids and sugars that really allow the birds to pack on some extra pounds, whether they're getting ready for migration or they're going to stick it out for the cold winter months. Um, and so looking at bluebirds and how they're switching their diet throughout the year and accounting for change, those changing needs, that's one example of um, what we need to do when we provide habitat uh, for them. But you know, still there's other components to that bluebird's habitat, right? It's not just the food. It's also the cover and, and the water and the space uh, to find those resources in. So if we stick with our bluebird example and we want to provide habitat for them, some other things that you might consider doing are um, providing cavities. So, you know, whether you have older or mature trees that are providing cavities, or if you put something man-made out there, uh, like a nest box, you know, something that we can create that is kind of mimicking those natural cavities for bluebirds. And this is a picture I took of a female that, I love this picture, she was so busy provisioning her nest and building her nest that uh, she didn't even hear me come up behind her. So I, I slowly snuck away so I didn't, I didn't disturb her. But we also know about bluebirds, you know, they like wide open spaces in which to hunt and nest. And that's why we often place our bluebird nest, bird, or nest boxes uh, in shrublands or native prairies or, or other open areas that are going to provide that insect and berry food source that they're looking for. Okay, so this is kind of the process you go through when you consider attracting wildlife. We need to remember all of these components that make up a habitat. Um, we need to account for any changes in that, that species life cycle. Um, and so today, Amy and I are gonna discuss how to do that um, and specifically how to provide food and cover resources with native shrubs and trees in mind. And as we do that, there are going to be some icons on the slide as we get into our different species. Uh, and they're gonna tell you, you know, what each plant provides in terms of food and cover for birds and pollinators. And then for some of these, we'll have a season associated, so, associated with them. So you know when that, you know, that nut or berry will be produced or when that plant is blooming. So we have our berries. Um, caterpillars, if you see this, it is denoting caterpillars, but you can also kind of think about the entire arthropod community. And so many of our trees and shrubs attract um, insects, we know that, but um, some of those insects are a little bit picky about the trees that they use. And that definitely applies to our lepidopterans, our butterflies, our skippers and moths. And so the females of certain species will choose certain plants and we can use that to our advantage, um, knowing that those caterpillars are a good food source for birds. We can pick and choose those plants that are gonna provide that food source. We'll talk about seeds and nuts, um, uh, nectar, pollen, and then that last little house icon represents cover for protection and nesting, okay? Um, so again, you'll see these at the top of your slides, but before we get into our plants, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy and she's gonna discuss a little bit on uh, planting. So 
it's really important that we choose plants and plant them correctly um, to make sure that they're going to be long lasting in our landscape. And so plants can be added into the landscape in several forms, including seeds, bare root, container, and bald and burlap. Seeds obviously take the longest time to mature, but can be fun and experimenting if you're collecting seeds from you know, other plants or people that you know. Um, some seeds will germinate more easily than others. Some require some treatment to grow. There are resources that can help you be more successful. And so look into that information of how to treat those seeds um, to have the highest germination rate. Bare root plants um, are often thought of as small plants ordered through maybe your local soil and water conservation district, typically in the spring. Uh, bare root plants um, are planted when they are dormant, or that's the preferred time frame to do that. Um, so they can be planted in the early spring or actually in the fall. There has been work with nurseries to grow larger bare root stock. And so some of our communities are actually going towards that um, to put plants in the landscape, specifically between the street and the sidewalk and in the, um, the, gar or the, the park system. Bare root plants are easy to handle and usually shipping cost is pretty low. Container plants are grown in a variety of size, sizes um, and are grown in soilless media which is often very different than our native soils that we're putting these plants um, into our landscapes. They can become root bound and need, that needs to be addressed before we put them in the ground. Because if you just plop them in the ground like they're coming out of that container, those roots are gonna continue to grow in that fashion and ultimately can girdle itself. Um, the bare root plants um, are, typically um, you know, dug in a nursery. So that type of native soil can be the same as yours or it can vary. They tend to be much heavier and more difficult to manage um, depending on the size of the root ball. It is important to remove um, that burlap as much as you can and any of the twine associated with that. Um, so because um, of that, you kind of choose which is the best for you and of course the availability. So next we're gonna talk about kind of just some brief steps on proper planting. And I know this is a lot of information, uh, but really it's made to just kind of highlight and remind you of those steps and really look into it further as you're planting um, trees and, and shrubs. And so what you have to do is really assess the site first. Have you done a soil test and how much space do you have? you really need to plan for the mature size of those plants. Um, and sometimes some of those plants maybe will outgrow the space that you can have. And so you need to choose plants that maybe are a little smaller. Next, you wanna make sure just like in this illustration that you're digging kind of a shallow but wide hole. Some people say that you wanna, you wanna dig a $50 hole for that um, you know, $5 plant. Although we know that plants are more expensive than that. But, you wanna make sure that that hole is much larger than the, the plant that you're putting in the ground to allow those roots to really get into the native soil. You wanna make sure that you're finding the root flare or those top roots. We are seeing plants coming out of the nursery much deeper in the ball and even in the container. And so it, we used to say plant it at the same level that it came out of the container or the ball, but we're finding that's much lower. And so if the tree looks like a telephone pole going into the ground or the shrubs look like telephone poles or utility poles, they've been planted too deep. And so removing that soil to find that root flare is very important. What you want to do then is you're going to place the plant in the hole and position the top of the ball at that soil level. And so again, finding where that root flare is. Sometimes in a heavy clay soil, people will actually elevate that ball just a little bit more or elevate that plant a little bit further. You want to make sure that your plant is straight uh, because that's the direction it's going to be growing. Although plants will recover for the sun, uh, we want to make sure that they're starting out as straight as possible. Remove any of those synthetic materials. And you may laugh and think, 
oh yeah, that's, I know that, but not everybody does. And so removing the burlap, the twine, and even the containers. Um, I've had people come in the office that they plop the container and all just in that hole and not even take out that, that container. So removing that is really important. As you're backfilling, primarily with native soil, because we wanna choose plants that are gonna do well, ultimately in the soil that we have, um, you're going to firm that soil in, and some people will water in, so you're reducing the air pockets that could develop, especially in our clay soils. You want to add mulch, typically a two to three layer or inch layer of mulch away from the trunk. Think of it as a donut almost, so you've got the hole where the, the plant is coming up. You want to avoid the volcano mulching um, that is very popular and we see it all the time. People, I think, see it and think, oh, that must be the right thing to do. But volcano mulching is awful for the plant and can cause long-term um, effects. If you have to stake the plant, so let's say it gets a lot of wind and you wanna make sure that it's staying upright, um, you can do that at the time of planting, but you wanna remove those stakes within a year's time. Um, if the plant does not need to be staked, uh, we recommend that you don't do that. Um, we want to make sure that the, the, the plant can kind of stand on its own ultimately. So those are some quick um, 10 tips on making sure that the plants that you choose are going to be planted correctly and will have a long life in your landscape. Awesome. So now that you know how to correctly plant, <laughs> now we can start talking about <clears throat> some of the different species. So we're gonna start out with a big one, the oaks. And the oaks may be one of the most important trees in the Northern hemisphere. They're very durable, they are long lived, which makes them great landscape trees. Um, they're you know, one of the most valuable hardwood lumber species. And then of course there's their importance to wildlife, which is high, highest probably. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why is you're looking at it, right? The acorns. Okay, more than 90 species of wildlife use acorns. And those species uh, of wildlife range from large mammals to small mammals, um, of course, down to our larger birds like turkey and grouse, and then our smaller birds um, as well. Um, blue jays in particular have a, a really um, important relationship with, uh, with oaks. So, uh, acorns are high in fat, they're high in protein, they're essentially the energy bars of the forest. And so here you're looking at white oak. Um, so if you see the, the, bold, the bolded text, you'll, you'll see that as we go through these different pictures. If you see that bolded text, that's um, telling you that that's what one of the pictures are. And so those are white oak acorns. And you see that there's uh, quite a few different species that, that we classify into the white oak uh, group. And so I've just listed three of them. There are more than that. And white oak are definitely um, the most preferred acorns, okay? And then on the right side, you see pin oak, which is a member of the red oak group. And um, I like these little, little acorns. They're really easy to identify because they're much smaller. They have those stripes. And they're also very attractive to birds because they are smaller, um, especially if they grow in bottomlands. This is a tree that doesn't mind having wet feet. And um, they can be really a really important food source to um, some of our waterfowl species like wood ducks. So now Amy and I are going to talk a lot about um, the great things about oaks. And uh, that may cause you to leave this webinar and say, oh, I got to plant oaks everywhere, which, you know, is great. You know, you want to plant some oaks, but it shouldn't be all that you plant. So Amy, tell us a little bit about the importance of diversity. Absolutely. And so you know, hopefully we are learning lessons about plant diversity, um, especially if you think in our urban environments. Uh, we have lived through the loss of elms from Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer with our ash trees. Um, and so we really need to think kind of big picture about, okay, if something likely invasive comes in, is it going to knock out all the hard work that we've tried to establish. And so we know that oaks are wonderful um, and you may have a favorite tree, um, but you've got to just caution yourself and make sure that you're planting a wide variety of plants, not just like the, the white oak that the photo that's on the screen right now. And so, um, but also outside of that family. 
And so really kind of mix it up. Um, I often tell homeowners if they're trying to choose a, a new plant for their landscape, what do you already have in your landscape? What do your neighbors have? And choose something that's different. Um, so we're reducing that possibility of kind of something coming in and wiping out everything. So you'll kind of get some, some taste of some different plants and you may get really excited about one of them. But again, don't go overboard and plant all of that, but rather really have diversity in your own landscape because it does support more wildlife and more activity. Thanks, Marnie. Yeah, diversity is key. Okay, so a little bit more about oaks then. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit more about, about the acorns. So as I said, we tend to group our species of oaks into white oak and red oak. Um, and, you know, like I said, the species that you're looking at just represent um, a few, there are definitely more. But there are some key differences between the acorns in these different groups. And that's what I wanna talk more about. So you see right away there that white oak acorns have less tannins than red oak acorns. And if you're not familiar with tannins, they are chemical substances that work to protect plants. So in the case of fruit uh, and from a tree, and when I say fruit from a tree, that, that does include like the hard fruit, like the seeds and the nuts, as well as the soft fruit, um, we call it mast. So I might say mast as we go through today, so you'll know what I mean. Um, but when we talk about the fruit from a tree or shrub like acorns, tannins will help to discourage fruit eating animals from eating that fruit until it's mature and ready for dispersal. How does it do that? Well, when there's a lot of tannin in the fruit, it makes it taste very bitter. I don't know if any of you have ever eaten a persimmon fruit before it's mature, but if you have, you know exactly what I mean. It is horribly bitter. You will never forget it. So in many cases, as the fruit um, matures, it is uh, ready for germination. And so the, the tannin content will lessen, making it more edible. So getting back to our red oaks, um, we see that they have more tannins and the reason why is twofold. And you see, I just popped it up here, one of the reasons. So red oak acorns take two years to mature versus the one year white oak acorns take. And so they need a little extra protection while they grow on the tree. So higher in tannins. Also acorns from both of these um, groups fall from trees in the fall. But while white oak acorns germinate that same fall, red oak acorns don't germinate until the spring. And so their tannin content remains a little bit higher as they're not quite ready to germinate yet. What does all this mean for wildlife? Well, it's, it's one of the reasons why white oaks are acorns are eaten so quickly in the fall because they're tastier from the get-go and because once they germinate, they don't pack as much of an energy punch. And so the wildlife aren't gonna let them sit out there for very long. But it also makes red oaks really important as a winter food source because they last over the winter. So while the acorn is a mighty thing, oak trays often or also offer uh, even more value in terms of food for birds. And what I'm really talking about here is the, the arthropod uh, community, um, really specifically in this case, caterpillars. So E.O. Wilson said that insects are the little things that run the world, and he was right on. When it comes to insects, oaks support 557 different species of lepidopterans. Remember, I, I, I talked about those earlier, the butterflies, skippers, and moths. And so with by an, an oak supporting that many different species, it's telling you there's going to be a lot of caterpillars uh, that are really important food sources for birds. As you see, 75% of birds that breed here in Ohio, and, and you could extend that into other states in the Midwest, um, they depend on caterpillars, so a really important food source. And I, I cannot describe uh, caterpillars better than Doug Tallamy does, so I won't try. And if you're not familiar with Doug Tallamy, he's the author of some very popular books that are all about, you know, putting native plants back into the landscape for the wildlife. So some of his books are Bringing Nature Home. Um, I'm looking over on my stack, Nature's Best Hope. And then he just put a new book out on the nature of oaks. So really great reads. Uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about, about this subject. But he describes caterpillars as soft little sausages with a thin wrapper. They're not as hard to digest as other invertebrates like beetles, which are all 
hard uh, and sharp edges. And that, at least to me, really hit home as to why caterpillars are so um, tasty to birds and, you know, little nestlings that if you've ever seen a parent feed uh, the nestling, they're shoving that insect down the throat uh, of, of their young. And it's a lot easier when it's all soft and squishy. And so oaks aren't the only uh, tree that support a rich arthropod, uh, including caterpillar community. So here is a list of ranking which plants support the most lepidopterans. And this uh, is from Tallamy and Shropshire. And so you see oaks top the list and uh, followed by some of the other species that Amy and I are going to be touching on today. So I did wanna provide you with that list if this is an area that really interests you. And then I've also included some herbaceous plants that al also attract a lot of Lepidoptera. And so as we go through, you're gonna see lists, plant lists. Um, Amy and I are going to share this presentation, uh, the slides of this presentation. So if you're frantically jotting things down, don't worry about it. We will make sure that you get a copy of these slides. One last thing I will say uh, quickly about oaks is, is that, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they live a long time. And as these uh, oaks mature, they end up having all of these little microhabitats that you see in this picture. And so oaks as a species, they dedicate a lot of their growth early to plant defense. And that's why they live longer. They're able to, you know, protect themselves. And so they have all these little unique habitats as they grow older, which as you probably know, um, you know, as, as being birders, cavities in trees are really important to a lot of our, our birds. And so these older mature oaks really support a lot of cover resources for our birds. And so here's a list of other hard mast producers that are also attractive to wildlife. Uh, I mentioned mast already uh, as you know, being defined as a fruit from a tree, whether it's a berry or a, a seed or nut. And Amy talked about diversity already. And this is another reason why diversity is, port is important. It, it, you need to have a diversity of mast out there as well. So some trees like oaks will take a while before they produce mast. And once they are producing, it's not on a consistent basis. They're going to produce good acorn crops anywhere from two to five years. Faster growing trees like poplar and birch, they're going to provide mast a little bit faster and a little bit more consistently. And then if you throw in some of your soft mast producers, like your berry producers, they're going to supply mast on a more readily available year to year source. Okay, so it's really kind of important to think about what's the, what fruit your trees are going to be providing for the birds and to kind of stagger that to make sure you have it covered throughout the years and throughout the different, uh, different seasons. And I've also, again, added to this list some herbaceous, herbaceous plants that provide a good seed source to, um, to birds. So moving on to maples. Maples, particularly red and silver, are really important early season sources of nectar and pollen for our bees when few other plants are blooming. And I don't know about you, you all, but this year I really appreciated the maple bloom because it had been a very long winter and I started getting out walking when we had that warmer weather and I just really enjoyed seeing those beautiful blooms. So they have that aesthetic value as well. When it comes to wildlife, they can be a backup food source when there's not a lot of other food available, but the seeds aren't, you know, I'll be honest, they're not really highly prized uh, by birds. But what maples do offer as they mature are good nesting sites for songbirds. The structure of them is often very dense and there's a lot of branches that provide um, those good nesting sites. And some, some of them as they mature um, will form those cavities that we looked at in oaks. And that of, of course are gonna provide cavities, you know, anywhere from um, larger to larger species like barred owls to great crested flycatchers uh, and nut, nut hatches. And then with maples, of course, you get the sap, which if you're a maple syrup enthusiast, you know, that's something that you can consider doing, tapping a tree. Um, my aunt only has about two or three on her property, but she taps them and gets a little bit of syrup. But that sap also attracts uh, butterflies. And the one you're looking at on that far right of the screen is the morning cloak. And morning cloaks, that's a butterfly that overwinters as an adult, 
So when they wake up in the spring and they need that food, they're going to go to sap flows uh, and get their sustenance that way. And so I'm going to turn it over to Amy now because she has an important reminder in regards to some of our maples. Yes, so speaking of maples, there are actually a couple invasive insect species that we are tracking, and those insects would love your maple or maples. The Asian longhorn beetle is a wood boring beetle that's been around for a while, but really has been a success story when we talk about eradication efforts um, that can work and that a species can be eliminated with those efforts. Um, it just takes a lot of time and a lot of money. The second is the spotted lanternfly that you might have heard about. While it's not an outright killer like emerald ash borer, or excuse me, like Asian longhorn beetle, it is a serious pest that was accidentally introduced to Pennsylvania and has been spreading. In 2020, we found the first spotted lanternfly in Ohio. Both of these insects are examples of, in space, of in space, invasive species that we are tracking using the Great Lakes Early Detection app. While I could go on about and on about this app, um, there are recorded presentations that you can tune in to learn more about how you can be part of this citizen science project on the Ohio State University's Woodland Stewards Program or website. And next month, I'm actually doing a session um, as part of this birder series on invasives and the Great Lakes Early Detection app. So if you're a birder, you're outdoors and you have binoculars, you can be part of this citizen scientist group that are looking for invasive species. So while you're out enjoying the birds, you can help us by taking a look and, and reporting what you're finding. Uh, the app is free, it's pretty large, um, and it's a really large outlook um, on different invasive species, both insects, diseases, wildlife, um, aquatics. And so it covers the Great Lake region, um, but there are other states that are, have something similar. Uh, this app uses what we call the EDD, which is the early detection and distribution, uh, which many states um, use that to collect the data and create maps. And so if you're interested, please learn more, ask questions and I'll, I'll, I can answer those. Uh, but this is a great tool to have on your phone while you're outdoors. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Lots of good information and pictures of the different species. So if you need help with ID, it's very helpful there as well. Okay, moving on to um, Prunus, cherry and plume. So this is a rather large genus. We'll do our best to kind of give you a good overview. Um, black cherry is uh, one of the largest native cherries. Um, I'm not sure how often it's used in the landscape, but for those of you that have larger property, this is a great tree to have out there. Choke cherry and American plum are more considered shrubs and um, they are quite valuable for the fruit that they produce. Um, and then American plum specifically can be really good uh, cover, especially if it is growing in thickets. When it comes to cherry, as you see um, from this top picture right here, the major value are the small berries that it produces, and they are readily consumed by a large number of, of different songbirds. And then on the pollinator side, Oops, getting ahead of myself there. On the pollinator side, members of the, the Prunus genus have, show, have very showy flowers. They're really important nectar and pollen resources for bees and other pollinators. And as you can see at the top there, cherries also host a large number of lepidopterans. So they're the second highest after oaks, followed closely by willow. So if tra attracting songbirds to your property is a priority to you, then I really encourage you to incorporate oaks or cherries uh, and or willows into your landscape, um, you know, to really be providing that arthropod community that songbirds are looking for. And I know there's also a few cultivated prunus species that provide good uh, resources in landscape. So Amy, can you tell us a little bit more about those? Sure, so the entire genus really offers, you know, interesting foliage, beautiful flowers and edible fruit. Um, the member, these trees and shrubs are members of the Rosaceae family, which you may be familiar with even going to the grocery store, um, you know, almonds and 
apricots, cherries, nectarines, peaches, plums, some that um, aren't native, uh, but definitely that we're familiar with. There's more than 400 species in this genus. Uh, Prunus virginiana or choke cherry. Um, it's also known as the Virginia bird cherry or bitter cherry. Uh, the straight species can reach heights of over 20 feet tall, but there are some cultivars like Canadian red, which the foliage emerges as green, and then it changes to a purple, and then finally red in the fall. So it's kind of got that, those characteristics. Um, Schubert does the same and has that change of color. It's just not quite as intense in the fall. Uh, the purple leaf sand cherry, which people may be familiar with, it's very common in landscapes. It's, um, it's actually a cross between two plants. So the sand cherry is from northeastern United States, but the cross is with the purple leaf plum, which is a non-native. So it has genetics of, of both. And it grows from between seven and 10 feet tall, so that it's a nice kind of size for smaller landscapes. Awesome. Okay. So watching our time here, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, next is our service berries. These are sometimes called June berries because the berries are um, produced a little bit earlier in the summer, earlier than, earlier than some of our other native berry um, producers. They're eaten by many birds, um, robins, catbirds, waxwings, orioles, bluebirds, the list goes on. They they disappear very quickly and probably have realized this if you have it in your backyard. It's one of my top native wildlife friendly, friendly trees um, for backyards and it's beautiful in the spring, right Amy? Absolutely and it can be a tree form or a multi shrub type form. It kind of depends on what your need is in your landscape and it really has been coined as a replacement for the invasive calorie pear. Um, they have little insect or disease problems and can really grow fairly well in both sun and shade. So they do make for a nice uh, landscape tree. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about hawthorn. Uh, hawthorn. There are uh, several species that are notoriously hard to tell apart, but for the most part, they're smaller trees with shorter trunks and very kind of broad, dense branching. They, they do best in full sun. Uh, and they provide really good nesting cover for our songbirds. So I'm working to get a hawthorn in my backyard for specifically that purpose. Uh, but they also do provide um, berries as well. Uh, they are, they typically do have thorns, which helps, you know, from the bird perspective to protect their nest against predators. So that's one of the reasons why they're uh, a good nesting tree. And those spines can be helpful in other ways as well. So I just had to mention the Northern Shrike, because I have an excuse to do so. It's such a cool bird. It's a winter resident here in, in Northern Ohio, um, but also in Indiana and Illinois and most of Pennsylvania. And then if you're North of those areas, you may even have some breeding, but apologies to those of you that are South of, of us, you probably will not see this bird as it's a Northern breeder. Um, but as, as Cornell, Cornell's All About Birds website reports, Northern Shrikes are pint-sized predators. So this is a smaller bird, and uh, but they're fierce predators. They prey on other birds, small mammals, and insects. And as you can see uh, from this picture, what's going on with that cricket, uh, northern shrikes will utilize thorns, not just from hawthorns, but other thorn or spiny plants, and they will spear their prey. They'll either do that to kill, kill it or often to save it for later. So it's kind of their storage uh, solution. It's really a fascinating bird. Uh, Amy, what else can you tell us about hawthorns? So it, they do come in a variety of sizes. So you can do a little research to find one that'll fit well in your landscape space. Um, some people um, are a little taken back by the thorns. So although Marty talked about how cool they could be, um, there are some thornless varieties like the Coxsboro um, hawthorn, which is probably the most common. There is the downy hawthorn, which um, typically isn't as thorny as others and maybe a nice 
way to kind of meet in the middle if um, you know you want the, the thorns for wildlife, but you're concerned with maybe small children in the area, you know, brushing up against them. So it is important to note um, that some of the hawthorns will get a rust disease. Um, Winter King um, is a type of green hawthorn that is a little bit more disease resistant. And so those are things to think about when you're incorporating new plants into your landscape. Definitely. Uh, so a little bit more on hawthorns. Uh, as I mentioned, there is uh, quite an abundance of fruit usually but it does tend to be a little bit drier. So what you're probably going to see is the fruit sticking on the trees until the winter, because you know if there's other food, they're going to avoid that drier fruit. But come winter time, when it's harder to find some food sources, that's when it's really going to become important for our overwintering birds. And then on the insect, insect side, one really neat thing about hawthorns as well as some of our other plants is that they offer these extra floral nectaries. And that's kind of what you're looking at, at on that uh, picture on the right. And you can actually see the nectar kind of bubbling out of those uh, glands. And so as my coworker Joe Bogg says, nectar is the currency used by plants to pay insects and other animals to do their bidding. So in the terms of, in the case of hawthorn, what it's really attracting is not, not the pollinators, but insect predators. Um, you know, insects like wasps and mantids and spiders, maybe even some beetles that um, will kind of use that extra floral nectary as a treat and then turn around and feed on insects that would harm the plant. So a really neat strategy of plants. And there are, like I said, other species that offer these extra floral nectaries. Um, so here's choke cherry, and then um, I think this is just another on the uh, the Kwanzaa cherry. But um, those nectaries are on different places depending on the plant that you're looking at. Um, so you know sometimes uh, catalpa, I think they're on the leaf midrib. On willows, they're on the leaves. So just kind of a neat thing um, that I think a lot of us don't realize is going on with our plants, and we don't often talk about attracting insect predators, but we should because they really help to keep plant pests at bay, uh, whether you're in a backyard or a community garden or you're planting next to a crop field. So to that note, here's a more comprehensive list of plants that attract insect predators. In the purple box right here are some of the plants and, or trees and shrubs that we're already talking about today. Uh, I've also included some perennials. And um, as you'll note, oops, those perennials are also um, really great plants for pollinators as well. So you may already be incorporating these plants into your environment for another purpose. And hey, bonus, they're good for this as well. Um, so Amy, I think you were gonna say a little bit more about that. Yeah, as we dive deeper into plants um, and we think about the roles or the jobs that these plants have, I think gone are the days that we're simply buying plants um, based on their aesthetics or their beauty, but rather what can they do for our ecosystem? And so while this may be a change in the thought process of many, or maybe some people still need to have that thought process changed, it really is a good consideration that needs to be adopted and shared with others. If you want to learn a little bit more about some of the insect pre predators, this is a fantastic book by Mary Gardner, who is an entomologist with OSU. I think it is available on Amazon, so um, feel free to check that out. Here's a longer list of trees that produce berries. I'll just quickly mention a few. So crab, apple, and sumac both hold berries into the winter, so another good overwintering source for our birds. And sassafras, which is pictured right here, really cool looking berries on these bright red stalks. Um, and they're very attractive to a lot of fruit eating birds. I will say though that sassafras is also um, uh, preferred by deer. So if you have deer issues, this may not be one to actively plant in your landscape. And then black gum is the other picture that you see there which uh, the fruits are ideal for larger songbirds like thrushes and, and waxwings. And they're also a good nectar source for pollinators. And then Amy, I think you're gonna tell us a little bit about hackberry. Yeah, so hackberry is a, a great plant. Um, there actually is an insect that we see commonly that some people even, that's how they identify the plant uh, by a, it's a, a nipple gall that we see on the undersides of the leaves, but it's not damaging to the plant at all. And again, it's part of that whole food web. 
Excellent. And then we move on to Redbud, Red Bud, which I think is, is one of the favorites for Amy and I. Um, it's so beautiful, uh, especially in the spring. Here in Columbus, we had a really nice, I feel like longer season. Uh, and the, it checks a lot of boxes uh, when it comes to a good wildlife plant. It's heavily used by uh, bees as an early, sec uh, early season nectar and pollen source. And it's just, it's just beautiful. It does have seeds um, that are rich in protein and that are, are eaten by birds. And Amy, I've even heard the flowers are quite tasty. Have you tried them? I have, and so if you haven't, um, they're probably past peak where you are now, uh, but next year make sure that you have that on your um, bucket list of things to do. Um, it's a great understory tree. Um, I love that the leaf cutter bees um, use the leaves and cut out these notches along the edge that don't cause any damage to the tree, but it is really interesting to know that they're supporting that habitat. Um, also, they're a great phenology indicator plant, and so when red bud is blooming, we know that gypsy moth caterpillars, another invasive species, is hatching, so we can kind of tie those, the timing of that insect, and to look for it. So as we're talking about, you know, the importance of red buds for pollinators, just here is a longer list of, of those, uh, those plants that also are, are really good sources of nectar, pollen, and, um, and host plants. And so we're gonna cruise along because we're running short on time. And we're going to get into, um, we're gonna finish up on trees and transition to shrubs. And, and the dogwoods are a great way to do this. We have two native trees, flowering and pagoda. And both of these trees do best in a mix of sun and shade. The fruit of the trees are a little bit larger, so they're not used as frequently by birds, but they are still a great one out there for birds, especially some of our larger birds uh, like robins and, and thrushes and, and, um, and species like that. And so Amy, I'm gonna let you talk about the shrub dogwoods. Yeah, so all of our shrub dogwoods uh, really do well in wet or moist soils, open areas. Uh, but they can, once they're established, uh, perform well in drier sites. Um, and for the most part, all have really a landscape appeal, especially the wed twi red twigs of the red oyster and the blue fruit and the impressive fall color of our silky dogwoods. The smaller fruit um, can be attractive to songbirds like Marnie had mentioned and really do provide cover um, if they're grown in groups or clumps. So dogwoods um, serve as host plants for over a hundred Lepidoptera, um, and they're one of one of um, Marnie and I's favorites. And that's just one of the Lept Lepidoptera that, uh, or Lepidopterans that will use dogwoods as a host plant. This is the spring uh, azier. Moving on to viburnums. These oppositely branched shrubs have huge landscape appeal and they're frequently planted in backyards and landscapes. There's quite a few natives. Uh, their cover is variable, but the ones that I have listed here are all good cover for songbirds. Um, they also are good berry producers. Um, the arrowwood I specifically pointed out um, there as it produces smaller berries, which the songbirds really gobble up quickly. Um, they offer nectar and pollen to pollinators I had to mention the clear wing hummingbird moth. This is that hummingbird moth that we see nectaring during the day uh, and just a really neat species. And they will lay their eggs on viburnums as one of their host plants. And then Amy's gonna talk about another insect. <laughs> Not so, yeah, so is attracted. <laughs> that's right. So um, if you do have viburnums, really take a second to learn more about the viburnum leaf beetle that is spreading into Ohio. Um, and so it is becoming problematic um, on our native viburnums. Uh, but do know that there are some that are more uh, resistant to this insect. Um, and there really is a variety of cultivars if space um, is a limitation too. And so you just have to kind of cross-reference what you're seeing or what you'd like just to make sure that you're not, again, opening yourself up and planting all of one kind of viburnum that is susceptible to that invasive species. And I just put a viburnum leaf beetle fact sheet in the chat. I didn't label it as such, but if you're interested in learning more about that, you can click on that link. 
So quickly going into button bush, this is a, a, another plant that likes wet feet, but it can also be a plant for the landscape. Um, Amy, tell us more about button bush. Yeah, so the flowers are very attractive to bumblebees, um, lepidopterans, and hummingbirds. It's a native plant that actually is listed a lot to be incorporated into rain gardens, uh, but it will again, once established, take dry sites. Um, it's really um, just a, a good plant, um, something that I think is underused that we can add more of those. Um, it still is an option for backyards and landscapes, and especially those um, if you're interested in attracting pollinators to your garden or your landscape. Yeah. So elderberry is another, uh, another great one. So um, beautiful spring blooms for the pollinators. They also have this soft, soft pith which um, Amy mentioned leaf cutter bees. So this is the mason bee you're looking at, but both of those species are looking for hollow stems to build their nests. And so elderberry is, is kind of another great one to have out there um, uh, for the pollinators. And then of course the uh, berries it produces are readily eaten by birds. And Amy, I've heard there's quite a few culinary uses for the berries as well. Right, so if you want to share with nature, um, elderberry wine or elderberry juice um, is liked by many. I've also heard there's an elderberry cider that is highly sought after, so we may have to try that. Uh, but really both species are considered um, early sessional shrubs, and so they grow best in full sun, but they can handle a little bit of shade. Uh, the red elderberry specifically prefers more of a wet site. So of course we have our rubus, raspberries, and blackberries. Um, Amy, tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, they're well known for their tasty berries, uh, really both for wildlife and for us as humans. Um, you'll just wanna plant more if um, you're planting for the birds, so you can enjoy some too. Um, just above everything from birds to mammals, uh, box turtles will eat them, so just really add them into the landscape. Uh, we know that deer will browse um, on them even though they have those those prickles, those small thorns. And so um, it doesn't stop the deer. Yeah. Now, while everyone may not have enough property to do this, I just wanna draw quickly your attention to um, field borders, edges or windbreaks, and just keeping in mind that these linear habitats can be really important habitat to some of our game birds like bobwhite quail, but also to our songbirds as well. Um, they'll use them during migratory times and even at times during uh, the breeding season. So these are also habitats, if you have them on your property, to really focus on. All right, and now hollies. Um, and I know we're running short on time, but this is really a, a beautiful plant um, to incorporate into your landscape and really think about um, beautiful flowers. I mean, they're not overly huge, but really what we're drawn to is the fruit that remains, especially um, becomes very uh, visible when the leaves drop. So this is one of our deciduous hollies. Um, it also is a good cover for shrub nesting birds. Um, and like I said, it, those berries will hang on. So they're a good food source going into the winter. And I just popped up a, a list. We've been mentioning, you know, all these different plants that provide those berries in the winter. This is just a more comprehensive uh, list. So a few others, if we haven't given you enough lists, um, these are a few other really great uh, shrubs to incorporate into the landscape for berries or pollinators or both. If you have questions on those, do let us know. And then we can't, we can't end this talk without a brief, a uh, very brief discussion on invasive plants. So go for it, Amy. All right, so while not all non-natives um, are invasive, we do have to share. Um, they, um, these plants are often introduced um, in the garden trade because of its, their beautiful characteristics, flowers and fruits. They're often very prolific, which can be an issue. They spread rapidly um, and really to the detriment of other species. And so the Ohio Invasive Plant Council has actually created a list of non-native are replacements for invasive species. So native plants that could be put in the landscape where now maybe non-natives or invasives are. 
And so that's a great list. And I think coming up, we've got a slide if we just got a another minute. Yeah, or we'll so get to... yeah, we'll get there. Um, so just quickly, you know, our non-native invasive species are just bad for the birds. You know, we can talk about this more if we have time for questions, but just know for the most part, they provide poor nutrition and poor nesting habitat. And the birds don't realize it. So they really, you know, it's really up to us to get them out of the landscape uh, for the birds. And so you'll see this list yeah, here that's on the screen. Um, and again, you can click on that link for the, um, the brochure that the Ohio Invasive Plant Council has created. And I will get that link and uh, pop it into the chat box for sure. So that's really it. Amy, you wanna talk real quick about Yard and Garden Online? Yeah, so this is a great website. If you're not getting this newsletter, you may consider signing up. Uh, there are alerts that go out throughout the year on seasonal interest. And so it's just a great tool to learn more about plants and insects and things that are happening out in nature. We also have the Woodland Stewards Program. So this is a, a program where we offer classes and workshops to basically anybody that's interested in learning more about natural resources. Um, and since we are talking about invasive species under publications, we have several that talk all about native or non-native plants and how to manage them. Here are some additional resources and books. Again, you will have this list when we send you out the slide set. And we're so sorry we ran <laughs> out of time. Uh, we get too chatty when it comes to plants. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. That was so informative. Um, I just want to remind everybody this was recorded. So if you didn't have time, if you don't have time to continue to watch, you can get it, you'll get an email and it'll be sent to you with the link and you can rewatch it. Um, and they'll also be sending out an email with the PDF of this presentation as well. Um, so that can help you with all of that information as well. Um, I did have some questions sent prior to this program from Matthew. Um, I think we answered a good portion of his questions. Uh, he first wanted to know about tree and bush varieties, which I think we touched on, you guys touched on. Um, but are there any specific planting patterns to use or any tips with planting patterns? Marty, do you wanna address that from the wildlife side? Um, as, as far as patterns, not really. Um, I was kind of thinking, um, kind of the, like have the, the your trees edge. on the outside, kind yeah. of with the, the, um, shrubs then and then open areas. So you're creating kind of a natural yeah. formation so that we would see. We taught, when we talk about, um, birds, sometimes we talk about creating soft edges and so if you have, you know, a, a woodland or even the edge of your property, you know, you kind of start with the tall, taller trees and then you pop on down with maybe the lower growing trees to the shrubs and, and maybe even incorporate a pollinator garden, you know, um, at the base. So kind of creating that gradual, um, that edge, and that's going to provide a, a variety of different heights if you are able to attract some nesting songbirds. But in the case of a woodland, it can... Um, sometimes provide some, some good habitat that they can't find within the mature woods, especially if you're incorporating some of those sun-loving shrubs. Um, so that's something that you might wanna work, uh, work towards. All right, and then uh, one more. How can we encourage birds and wildlife to nest here without any mature trees on the property? Yeah, so this would be a good time to, to remind everybody that it's not just the mature trees, uh, that produce habitat for the birds. So we often think about songbirds and we, we associate them with, with forests, mature forests, but there are a whole host of other species that really like younger forests, so those shrubbier or scrubbier stages. And here in Ohio, and I think, you know, as well as the surrounding states, that kind of habitat is really hard to come by. Um, here in Ohio, especially, it's one of the rarest. And so some of our species that really like those young forests, those shrubby forests are declining because we don't have enough of them. So uh, again, we go back to that discussion on edge. If you can provide some of those sun loving shrubs and kind of that border where you have kind of that, those denser 
shrubby trees grow or shrubs growing, uh, that kind of provides that habitat that they're looking for. And then don't forget about grasslands and prairies, things that we think about incorporating for pollinators, but we have species of birds that also look for those grasslands as well and can find insect and food resources in them. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanna let everybody know that I put two links into the chat. The first link is our Seek Refuge Days program link. So you can see what programs we have coming up. And then the second link in there is for a survey. Um, we'd appreciate that if you would take that for us, um, let us know how we're doing. And you also will get a special, special uh, coupon code for the Rookery Nature Store if you do take that. Um, it looks like Marnie and Amy put their contact information in there too. If you have any questions, um, you guys can contact them through their emails there. Um, but it looks like we don't have any more questions. So I just wanna thank everybody for coming and thank Marnie and Amy for presenting for us today. That was really great. Um, so I hope everybody has a great rest of their week uh, and thank you for coming. Thanks everyone. We'll see ya. Bye, everybody.